Good evening. This is my Wednesday night Bible study. I'm Douglas Griffin. It is February the 24th, 2021. Wow. Okay. So, no, I don't want to customize my dashboard. Okay. Um, we are in the book of Matthew, chapter 24. Jesus went to the temple and showed out. Um, and then as he left the temple, he went to the Mount of Olives. And he said, see all these, you see how incredible this, no, actually the, the disciples are the one who pointed out the temple, which is very interesting. <laughs> but, um, oh, master, look how pretty the temple is. They're trying to calm him down, I guess. And Jesus says, you see all this, isn't it incredible? Well, there's not one brick that's standing now that won't be thrown down soon. And it's like, what? They asked him three questions. When will these things be? And he's talking about when will the temple be destroyed? And that's actually the first question he answers. Then, what would be the sign of your coming? Because if you're taking down the temple, that must mean we're going to show up as the conqueror and, and get rid of the Romans. And they had all their ideas of what that meant. But they knew the Messiah was going to come and bring salvation, but also bring judgment. So what would be the sign of your coming? They were not talking about the second coming. They didn't even understand that he was going to have to die. So they certainly weren't asking, so... When are you going to die and then come back and then come back a second time? They weren't met. But when they say the sign of your coming, they mean coming in power like it's been predicted that you would come, like in Malachi, you know, he's going, to, he's going to come and bring judgment. So that's, when are you bringing judgment? And then, and what's the sign of the end of the age? And he answers those questions in order. So first he's telling them, when will, when will these things be? When, when will the temple stones be thrown down? And he says, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Now, the abomination of desolation is specifically when he says, he says the Messiah is going to come. This is Daniel. Gabriel's talking to Daniel in, in Daniel chapter. We read that, that Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 7, that, that area. Uh, Gabriel, the angel Gabriel is talking to Daniel and he's had a vision. He says, this is what it means. And he tells him exactly when the Messiah is going to show up. And he says, and then that last week of years, that last seven years, right in the middle of it, after three and a half years, Messiah will be cut off. And that cut off word is the word they use for animal sacrifice. Cut, cut, right? In the th and then there's three and a half years left. Uh, so right in the middle, Messiah will be cut off. Then at the end of that three and a half year period, then the people of the prince, the people of that Messiah, because uh, they called him Messiah the prince, the people of that prince. And he's not talking about a different prince. A lot of people interpret that, well, that's the Antichrist, because he's coming in judgment. That's got to be the Antichrist. No, that's the same person. It's the same person. There's an, he, he describes the Messiah, then he says, and then the people of the Messiah, the people of that prince who's coming, they're going to destroy the temple. And that's the abomination of desolation. When you see the people of the prince coming and surrounding Jerusalem. In fact, in Luke, he didn't even translate it abomination of desolation because Luke is writing to Gentiles and he knew the Gentiles would not know what the abomination of was by Daniel the prophet. So he just simply says, when you see the Roman army surrounding Jerusalem, because that is what the abomination of desolation is that's spoken of by Daniel. So, when you see that, that's when the temple is going to be thrown down. So, he answers that question first. And if you're on the rooftop, once you see the army surrounding, and the, army, and the, the armies were out there for three and a half years. Interesting. Uh, once you see that happening, if you're on the rooftop, come down, flee. Go to the mountains if you're in Judea. He, he's very specific. This is not talking about today unless everyone in the world is going to be living on a rooftop in Judea. Um, he's only talking to those people, those Christians. If you're still in Jerusalem, even though I told you to go to Jerusalem and then Samaria and then get out, if some of you are still hanging out in Jerusalem, get out. Because once you see those Roman armies, that's the sign of when the temple is going to be thrown down. However, then he answers, what would be the sign of your coming? He says, well, like lightning coming from the east, and it flashes to the west. And, when you, and, and that's what he's going to be describing. And then next he's going to be this, this, tell them, 
what's the sign of the end of the age? So that's the final part of Matthew 24. Here's how you'll know when the end of the age, and what age are they talking about? The end of the Jewish age, the end of the, the age that went from temple to age, the end of the law, it actually started with Moses, right? And it ends when that Jewish temple is destroyed. And then the church age begins. And for a 40-year period, they're kind of simultaneously. The Jewish period is coming to an end. Someone said it's like a relay race. When you see someone ha handing off a baton, the runner that's waiting for the baton, they start running. And for a little while, for about 20 feet, they're both running. He's trying to catch up and hand the baton, and the other person is running because they're about to grab the baton. But they're both running, and then finally the baton is handed off, and the, and that first runner is done, and the next runner takes it on. So so it's that same period. There's a 40 year period where the Jewish age is during that 40 year period when Paul went around teaching the gospel. Then once the temple is destroyed, that's when the new age will begin. So Jesus is answering all three of these questions. But right now he's asking, answering, what's the sign of your coming? Okay. So, um, as a reminder of this verse in Malachi 3, because it's kind of the theme of this, of where we are in, in Matthew 24. In Malachi 3, verse 1, to remind you, it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. That's a reference to John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, Prepare you the way of the Lord. He prepared the way for Jesus. And then the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the measure of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. So they're like, yeah, he's coming to the temple. Like, no, 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 no. That's not a good thing. He says, because who can endure the day of his coming? So uh, he's, he's saying it's, it's, you, you won't be happy to see him come to the temple. So I want to start with, because Jesus went to the temple twice. So I want to remind us of the first time he came to the temple. Only John records it. Only John records it in his in his gospel. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're writing down everything that Jesus did and they're as to what they thought was important uh, to whatever audience they were speaking to. Mark is writing to the Romans. Matthew's writing to the Jews. Luke is writing to the Greeks. John is writing to the Christians. So he includes it because Jesus had a message there. So anything that John thought was pertinent to the church age, to the Christians. Those are things that he included. So John includes uh, the first time that Jesus went to the temple, and he went at the very beginning of his ministry, uh, and he kicked them all out. In, in John chapter 2, Jesus has just gone to the wedding at Cana, and uh, they ran out of wine, and so his mom uh, had them bring in a bunch of barrels of wine, and then she asked Jesus, uh, will you please uh, fix this? And Jesus says, oh, because lots of kids do when their mother's asking them to do stuff. And then Mary went to the edge, okay, whatever he says, just do it. Uh, so sure enough, he turned the water into wine. And right after that, he and his mom and his family, they left the wedding. And it says in John chapter 2, verse 11, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. It's like, wow, he just turned water to wine. So maybe I will follow this guy. Maybe he's not just a crazy person. Verse 12 of John chapter 2, just the very beginning, just the second chapter of John. And after this, he went down to Capernaum. He, his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. And they did not stay there many days. So they had all been, Jesus and his brothers, which were really his cousins, but we'll get into that later. Um, uh, they're all at the wedding. His mom, they all, uh, and the disciples who followed Jesus, they were all at this wedding, and they left. And uh, they did not stay there many days, it says. And in verse 13 of John chapter 2, it says, Now the pastor of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Okay? And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers doing business. And when he had made a whip of cords, it's fantastic. So he made him a whip. Okay, somebody go get me my switch. Go get my belt. And he made a whip, and it had little knots on the end of the with the. And and so he made a whip of cords, 
and um, it said he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' monies and overturned the table. So at the, right at the beginning of his ministry. And so the Jew, uh, so I'm just skipping down because obviously everybody got upset. But uh, I'm, I'm in, in verse 18 of John chapter two, I'm just skipping down. So the Jews answers and said to him, what sign do you show to us since you do those things? It's like, okay, uh, you think you can just kick everybody out of the temple and, and like you're the Messiah or something. What sign, why should we listen to you? And Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. So of course they didn't know what he was talking about. That's why they went back in the temple and said, we can ignore that guy. Uh, verse 20, then Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Now here's what they mean. Um, back like 150 years before this, Anti Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek general had come and it had been prophesied in Daniel. He had come and he had really messed up the temple, right? And he sacrificed the pig on the altar and he was just nuts. Um, and the temple was in, in a lot of decay and it was that way for about a hundred years. And then when the Herods were put in charge, <coughs> excuse me, when the Romans said, we need somebody to handle these people, and they kicked the first Herod, um, Herod the Great, and put him in charge, he set about restoring the temple. So uh, he's been in, in, in power for about 46 years now at this point. And so that's why when they say it took 46 years to build this temple, they mean to just to restore it, repaint it. And he made it glorious, painted it all white and gold, and it's in, and it sits on three stories, right? And you go up the hill, and it's it's in all these stories. You know, it's it's just this fantastic thing that's several football fields long. It's incredible. So he says it took forty six years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days. You're going to destroy this temple and raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And the reason I bring this up because Jesus is declaring himself the new temple. I'm the temple now. You won't need this temple. Had they been listening and understanding, you won't like, what, what authority do you get to this temple? I am now the temple. Remember he went to the woman at the well and said, you know, the time is coming. Because she says, where do we worship? In that temple or in that one? Time is coming when you're not going to worship in either one of these mountains. And the temple was on a mountain. That's what he meant. That's what she meant. Which mountain that had the temple? And neither one. But those who worship, worship in spirit and in truth. We don't need to now go to the temple anymore. Jesus is the temple. He was, he's, he's now, who, he's where we go. He's the sacrifice. He's, he, right? Because that was the purpose of the temple was for sacrifice. The sacrifice is so they can reunite with God. He says, I'm the temple. I'm now the place where you go if you want to reunite with God. If you want to confess your sins, if, if you want to be forgiven, we don't need to go to the temple any longer. I'm the temple. So the sign I'm giving you is you destroy this temple because I'm now the temple. I'm going to raise it up in three days. And that will be the sign to you. Uh, but they didn't know what he was talking about. So they said, okay, he's crazy. He thinks he can raise his temple in three days. So they just went back in and set up the tables. And they didn't think about Jesus for three and a half years. Back up right. Started playing their, their jams and said, hey, hey. So they had, Jesus came back three and a half years later. I tell you to stop that. And so he knocked all the tables over again. And, and he walked out. And they said, that man crazy. Wasn't that the same man was here three and a half years ago? Yes. And so now he's uh, explaining to the disciples, okay, now I am talking about this temple and all that's, I'm not talking about the temple of my body any longer. I am talking about this temple. It's going to be thrown down. And if you just remember what I said, I'm going to be the replacement. Okay. So uh, I'm just reminding us of that first, of uh, Matthew chapter 24, the first verse. The Jesus went out and departed from the temple after he knocked it all over. Disciples came up to him to show him all the buildings. Do not see all these things. Not one stone should be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat on the Mount of Olives. And they came to him probably saying, tell us, when will these things be? When will the temple be thrown down? That's the first thing he answers. Which is, when you see the armies around Jerusalem, what will be the sign of your coming? And that's what we were in the middle of answering last week. Um, and at the end of the age. Okay, so. Just want to read this last section from Josephus who recorded it. Remember, Josephus escaped when the Roman armies began to come down from the north and conquer all these different 
Jewish cities. They're heading toward Jerusalem. Josephus escaped. He didn't kill himself like everybody promised. Yes, we will all kill ourselves. And Josephus says, okay. And so he escaped. And so he's recording everything that's happened. He says, there were tremendous earthquakes recorded. There was smoke filling the air and a type of darkness. And the rebels, he's talking about the zealots. So inside Jerusalem, there's, there's two things going on. On the outside, the Roman armies are surrounding and they're marching down toward Jerusalem slowly. And now they're outside. And there were earthquakes and there was fires and all this stuff going on. Inside Jerusalem, the, the zealots are fighting the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all the, the, all the different groups, the Hasmoneans, all of them, they're all fighting each other. And the zealots are really crazy. And so they're killing people. And it says, and the, and the, the, the rebels, the zealots, installed a clown named Fanny as the high priest and dressed him in priest's garments and seated him on the Holy of Holies at the throne. So they said, we don't, we're going to have our own God. Now, they were all about nationalism. This is our Jewish state, and we must protect it. God gave this land to us. We must protect it. They were no longer seeing things spiritually. They were no longer caring about Jesus, I mean, not Jesus, the God and spiritual things. It was more important to protect the land that they were given. And so they lost their minds at this point. And then we, we'll just have our own high priest. And they actually took this goofy person and just dressed him as a high priest and put him on the throne. Uh, desecration. This is Josephus. See? Yes. And a mockery. The rebels were so depraved. It says the ensuing tribulation was greater than anyone could have imagined. Starvation, eating of children or food. Now, don't forget, the rebels, they cut off all the food supply because they were going to force everybody to fight. So they made sure, so now there's no food. So cannibalism was taking place. It was horrible. It was horrible. But they did it to themselves. Because Jesus said, get out of Jerusalem, and they went. Okay, Matthew 24, 27, 28. This, this is where we were last week. And Jesus says, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the, summing of the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be together together. And the same word for eagles is the same word for vultures. So they use the same word. So um, he, he's like, you know. The city's going to be dead. When you see the vultures circling the city, then, then you know the jig is up. Time is up. All right, he used the jig last week. Okay, Josephus. It says, in AD 70, upon seizing the temple, the Romans set up their ensign on the eastern gate and offered sacrifices to them. So they had their and their little idols that they created, which was an eagle. So the, the Romans set up eagles all around Jerusalem, and Jesus said, wherever the eagle is gathered, that's where the carcass is going to be. And just interestingly enough, this is Josephus saying that the Romans set up their inside, which was, which was this eagle, and they had them all around the city. Uh, it says the main ensign was Aquila, this is Josephus, the eagle that carries Zeus's lightning bolt. So they had an eagle with a lightning bolt. And Jesus mentions lightning, and he mentions eagle. Um, uh, you know, when you see that sign, that's, that's the signing of the coming of the son of man, which, which is made in judgment, Matthew 24, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. So this week, I want to look at a prophecy of Joel's that we heard given on the day of Pentecost, and I'm hoping that we'll hear it totally in context this time and really understand well so here's the entire here's the prophecy that joel gave in his second chapter he says blow the trumpet in zion and sound an alarm in the holy mountain that all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the lord is coming for it is at hand skipping down to verse 10 the earthquakes before them the heavens tremble the sun and the moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness so remember, this is that language that they use whenever they were talking about judgment coming. They always talked about this moon being dark and the sun being dark because they're saying that that same feeling, it's all symbolic of being in night and gloom coming. He says, the Lord gives voice before his army for his camp is very great. 
For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So whenever they're talking about the day of the Lord coming, it's all, it means judgment. Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 13. Now, therefore, says the Lord to me, with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So before judgment comes, he always gives us opportunity to repent. God always warns us. People get warning, and we ha always have time to repent. You, people warn me, hey, hey, you need to fill up those tires, or, oh, your engine sounds funny. We get warning. We get warning, <laughs> and we need to go, okay, I need to listen. Are we going, I got plenty of time to take care of that. So then Joel, he gives the warning that the day of the Lord is coming, and then he asks them to what Jesus was doing. He warned, but he always gives room for repentance before judgment. So turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of a great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. He, he's not anxious to do the harm. So even when you see the Romans out there and you've ignored the warning, Joel's saying you'll still have time to repent. Once you know the day of the Lord is coming, once there are earthquakes, and Josephus told us there were earthquakes, and the armies are there, and you see smoke and all this stuff, that's the day of the Lord coming. Hello. You still have time to repent. So salvation is always offered before destruction. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So he's telling us there's this time coming after the crucifixion. The crucifixion is the signal for judgment. Once you've rejected the Messiah and crucified him, the day of the Lord is coming. It cannot be stopped. So when, when, when once... He's brought the Messiah, and Jesus warned them in every parable he could come up with. And, you know, and I sent them my son, and, and then they rejected him. And what should the landowner do? Well, you should kick those people out. Yes. So once you reject Jesus and say no, you say crucify him. You say his blood be upon us and upon our generation. Once they've done that and they've rejected. So, and here's what's interesting. Even though crucifixion is part of the plan for our salvation, it's also... The people who crucified him, they're in line for judgment. So God is so economical, he used that situation to, to, to save us and yet to judge them. Um, and, and so once they rejected him, Peter, in looking at what happened, because remember Peter got that big um, lesson after Jesus was crucified and Peter and John, they were weeping and, oh, no, it's all messed up, not knowing that's part of the plan. And sometimes we're that way. There are things that we think, oh, no, it's all messed up now. It's horrible. And God's like, no, that's part of the plan. Just calm down. It's part of the plan. So they run to the tomb and Jesus' body is gone. And as they're walking home, some man comes up to them and starts talking to them. And they're like, he's like, why are you so upset? Well, you know, the Messiah came and all this bad stuff. And really? And he gives him this Bible lesson, and the Bible says that he went through everything, every scripture. So this could have been six, eight-hour Bible study. You think mine are long. And explained everything that happened. He says from the beginning all the way through, he showed them. These are all messianic scriptures referring. And they went, oh, even in Joel. Oh. So then once Jesus disappears, he goes, surprise, boom, he's gone. Um, then... He, uh, they go back to the disciples and say, oh, it was Jesus. I, we get it now, right? Jesus ascends to heaven, and then they wait around for the promise of the Spirit, and then Peter is able to get up and preach and says, now I understand that part of Joel where he says, it shall come to pass afterward that I pour out my Spirit in all flesh. So after they commit this horrible sin of crucifying their Messiah, that triggers the new age, right? We're ending the Jewish age, the covenant breakers. Again, Peter's Jewish. Paul, they're all Jewish. So God's not judging Jews. He's judging the covenant breakers. The covenant keepers who are Jewish, they're the ones that, you know, brought the word to the rest of the world. But that, but now it goes to everybody. So that's what I mean by the end of the Jewish age, where he had selected those people 
to carry his word and to be keepers of it and then present it to the rest of the world. Now it's time for the church age, for the rest of the world to get the word. So Peter went, oh, and he started preaching this sermon because it, it's the last part of Joel, right? Where it says, and it shall come to pass afterward, I will pour out my spirit in all flesh. Now now God's pleaded to pour his, pour his spirit on us and to be in us, right? Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So Peter's saying this is exactly in order that was supposed to happen. Judgment comes. Then he tells everybody, repent, rend your hearts, and then after you've done that, I will pour out my spirit on you. So, Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, right? And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So when all of this starts happening, right, the, uh, he's already poured out his spirit for those who have repented and rended their hearts and opened up and said, we repent that we rejected you. We now, we see you. Those people get the spirit. Those who are still in rebellion, who are still in Jerusalem, still fighting for land, fighting for buildings, they're going to get, the judgment will come on them. Uh, so Joel, and here's the last part of Joel chapter two. It says that I will show wonders in the heavens. So this is after I poured out my spirit on those who are ready to receive it. At the end of that age, I am going to show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. So Peter was correct in saying he's pouring out his spirit now. And then they hung out in Jerusalem until Stephen was killed. And then they got out of Dodge and started spreading the word, just like Jesus had told them to do. But the others stayed there. They said, no, we are staying here. We're waiting for the Messiah to show up. He's going to save us. Okay, so back to Josephus. I just want to read these last things. And from uh, Deo Cassius, who was a Roman who, who wrote in the third century about what happened. Meanwhile, now that Vespasian is emperor and he must return to Rome, he turns the siege over to his son Titus, tells him to finish the job. So Vespasian... He, Vespasian, he left, he went to become emperor. Titus is there. He's going to finish the job. So Titus attacks just after Passover in the year 70 CE, battering the city with his catapults, which propel a rain of stone, iron, and fire onto the population. We've seen those old movies, right? They put fire and molten lava and stone and they over the walls because Jerusalem had this incredible tall wall around. And so Fire and stone is raining on people, which is exactly what Joel said. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke will start raining down from heaven. And that's what Titus did without reading the scriptures. He didn't read the scripture and go, oh, I should do that. That's a good idea. God just saw what was going to happen. And Joel's seeing what's going to happen. And he's saying, this is what happened. Fire is raining from heaven. So they used the catapults to propel a rain of stone iron and fire into the population and by then the city defenders are weakened from hunger and perhaps even more so from internal strife even so it takes titus two months of intense fighting before he's able to breach the inner city walls and reach the temple mount so he's still they've got this machine thing and i'm calling it a machine well they actually call it a machine but because it had moving parts and they're still battering the walls battering the walls and they're throwing fire on top of the people and they're battering the walls and trying to get in Okay, so Deus Cassius, he, he reports this. This is the Roman historian in the third century. He says, though a breach was made in the wall by means of engines, that's the word they use for anything that had more than one moving part. It had two parts, like, ooh, that's an engine. Sounds like my first car. It only had two moving parts. Nevertheless, the capture of the place did not immediately follow even then. On the contrary, the defenders killed great numbers of Romans who tried to crowd through the openings. So they, they made an opening in the wall and Romans are trying to crawl through the wall. And of course, as you see a head coming through, they just chop it off. Say, oh, that didn't work. Send somebody else in. I'll go, I'll go next. So the Romans are trying to crowd through the opening and they also set fire to some of the buildings nearby. So they're, 
they're finally pushing their way through and making the hole bigger and people are fighting them and trying to keep them from coming through the wall, right? Hoping to thus check the further progress of the Romans. So they're setting things on fire around them so that the, as they come through the opening, there's a bush on fire and there's things on fire. They're just trying to stop them from coming. Nevertheless, the soldiers, because of their superstition, did not immediately rush in because they're like, uh, we've heard about this God. We've heard about this um, God of the Jews. And I don't know if we want to go and attack the temple because uh, we don't want something to happen. And so they were superstitious. They did not immediately go to the temple, even though they're right next to it, because the temple's next to that eastern wall. He says, uh, but at last, under compulsion from Titus, they made their way inside the temple. Then the Jews defended themselves much more vigorously than before. So the temple is on three stories. It's three stories high, and you have to go up this walkway, and you're in the outer court, and you're going up, and you're, you're fighting the Jews as you continue to go up because you have to go up to the tallest part. The actual entrance to the temple is at the top part. Okay. So uh, as if they had discovered... So they're fighting even more vigorously than before, the Jews that are left, right, who are defending the temple, as if they had discovered a, a piece of rare good fortune in being able to fight near the temple and fall in its defense. So we're going to defend the temple to the end, even though Jesus, okay. So despite the determined resistance of the Jewish defenders, Titus slowly works his way to the temple mount. Now a duel to the death ensues. And finally, five months after the Romans had begun this attack, so right after Passover, right in April, they start. it's not until September that they finally get in and up through the temple, right? They're just fighting for five months. Can you imagine? Okay. So, had be so five months after he'd begun this attack, Titus orders the second temple raised to the ground. The day is the ninth of Av, the very same day in which the first temple was destroyed. Coincidence? I think not. The populace was stationed below in the court and the elders on the steps and the priests are in the sanctuary itself. So the regular system citizens are down in the court. The elders are on the, on the, the steps as you're going up and the priests are at the very top in the actual where the sanctuary is. Okay. And though they were but a handful fighting against the far superior force, they were not conquered until part of the temple was set on fire. So they finally had to start setting the temple on fire. Okay. Then they met their death willingly, some throwing themselves on the swords of the Romans, some slaying one another, and others taking their own lives, and still others leaping into the flames. So if we, 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 we don't want you to kill us, we're going to kill ourselves. These are the zealots. All of the neighboring courts, are, and I want you, next time you're reading through the Old Testament, and it mentioned Jesus' disciples, and his, this one, and that one, and there's Simon the Zealot. Yeah, I want that to mean something different to you. Like, oh, he's the crazy one. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. So, uh, they're going to take it. Uh, now, all of the neighboring countryside is denuded of whatever trees remained from the siege. So, there's greenery around the city. They take all the trees and cut them down, and they're going to make a huge bonfire. So they're denuded of the remaining trees from the siege to create the giant bonfire to burn the buildings of the temple to the ground. The intense heat from the fire causes the moisture in the limestone to expand, and it explodes like popcorn, producing a chain reaction of destruction. So if you're looking at the temple, suddenly it just starts exploding in the air. The stones are exploding. There's fire, smoke, and explosion of, of hail, and right? Now, Jesus says, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because they're seeing the temple explode and there's sm smoke and fire, just like Joel predicted, just like everyone predicted. Malachi verse chapter 4, verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up and this time it wasn't hyperbole. This time it wasn't like, oh, it's not really going to burn. The temple was on fire and people were leaping into the flames and it's exploding like an oven. It was that hot that it's just ex exploding. Okay, and the day the Lord which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. And finally, Deo, Deo Cassius says, in a day's time, in one day, the magnificent temple is nothing but stubble. 
So there was nothing left, neither root nor branch. So this is Malachi saying this is exactly what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. It has already happened in the past. And Jesus was preparing them, but who was listening? So it says, and he will send his angels, verse 31, with the sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So who are his elect? So right after, at this point, um, well, let me tell you, let, let Joel, so Joel has explained step by step what's going to happen. That the day of the Lord is coming. He says, but if you repent and rend your hearts. So, and the day of the Lord, the, what triggered it is, is, the, is the crucifixion of Jesus. And then many people repented. And he says, then I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh. And so those people get saved and they start to go out. Then he says, then the day of the Lord will actually show up and it will burn like an oven and everything will be reduced to stubble, right? Then at that point, God's elect, those people who had chosen him as opposed to defend the city, they chose spiritual things over nationalism. They then, be, now the church age is in full effect, and they, they, they go out and start preaching the gospel everywhere. At this point, it had only been Paul, really, and a few other disciples who had been preaching the, the, the gospel to this point. But Paul... And Peter and all of them, uh, Nero takes care of them around the same time. But now the, the gospel spread like wildfire all over Europe. It went, it went all over the, the world after this happened. He says, I go gather my elect from the four winds, even from one end of heaven to the other. Here's what Joel says at the end of that long prophecy. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So after it burns like an oven, after the covenant breakers are destroyed. The covenant keepers go out. It says, and whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. As the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord calls. Don't forget that the Christians who were in Jerusalem, when they saw the Roman army, those who were still left, still hanging on to Jerusalem, people will just hang on to their old stuff. The people who were left, hanging on to Jerusalem, when they saw the Roman armies, they all escaped and went to the mountains in Pella. Once Jerusalem was destroyed, they scattered to the four winds and they began to spread the gospel. And whoever called on the name of the Lord got saved. So in Malachi chapter 4, verse 2, after that day that will burn like an oven, he says, but to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. So he always presents two. Just like when Moses uh, had them on the mountain, Ed, on one mountain, another mountain, I present to you blessing and cursing. Uh, I present to you life and death. He always says, choose life, choose blessing. And that's God always telling us. We can either obey his voice, and, and then we go out, because we're those who, who fear his name, and the sun rises with healing in its wings, and, the, and righteousness, and we, are, we receive God's blessing, or we can ignore his voice, we can defy his voice, and judgment comes on us. And, and I didn't make up the rules. God, that's, that's like with anything. Don't touch that stove. It's hot. You can either obey and have a healthy hand, or you can go, ah, ah! And, 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 and whose fault is that? Is that the fault? That's our fault for our rebellion. People don't want to hear that God brings judgment. No, how did, God is a loving God. He would never do this. So, and I was, but see, you haven't read the Bible. You're just creating a God that's convenient to you, that just is always nice, and everyone gets first place, and everyone wins, and he just, and that's, and that's not the real God. If there are not consequences, we don't have to pay attention to him. God knows that. And, and when you ever, you had a substitute teacher, whenever we had substitute teachers in junior high or in high school, and, and you would run over them because you did not, not listen to you. I mean, sometimes they come in and they have an iron fist and you just listen. And, and any God that we can just run over, any God that he's, he's our servant, we just, we, we tell him what to do and we can just do whatever we want and he doesn't care because he just loves us. That God's not worth saving. He, but 
that same God who brings consequence, he, he always, with every temptation, makes a way of escape. He always promises blessing. He says, to you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. Like, he, he's not the mean God. It's always, he's not ready. He's like warning us of judgment that's coming. That teacher warns you, if you don't study, you're going to fail the test. That teacher gave me a fail. No, you gave yourself a fail because he said, if you don't study, you're going to fail. But if you listen to me, and I'm giving you the answers. I'm giving you the answers. And that's what God is saying. So we want to be those that listen to his voice because it doesn't do any, any good to obey him. God wins all the time. Maybe you could ignore that crazy uncle and he would forget what he said. But God never forgets what he said. If God says, I want you to do that, you're not going to get off the hook till you do it. So we might as well just obey when we hear God. If God says, just keep your mouth shut, don't say anything to that person. I know they were crazy. He'll take care of it. He'll fix it. We need to learn to be obedient to his word. So we're going to get to the, well, the part I've just been waiting. I've been waiting 16 weeks. I've been in Matthew chapter 24 for 16 weeks. We get to the good verse about the fig, when the, the coming of the fig tree. I can't wait to get to that. So that's what we'll be talking about. Next week, that's the very next thing that Jesus says, because of what's going to be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And that's what Jesus addresses in the next part. Here's how you know that we're going from one age to the next. Okay, so again, thank you so much for listening in. That's just, it's amazing. Uh, and and I, I hear some of you, so you on Sunday, we're in, we're in uh, Genesis, and uh, Eliezer is trying to find a bride for Isaac. And then others of you, I'll see you again next week. And again, I just really thank you for, for, for tuning in. God bless you and keep you. Oh, and may his continents fall upon you and give you peace. Amen.